What's up animators and welcome to part one of my seven part beginner blender course, where we'll be making this beautiful abandoned house in the middle of the forest. We'll start from zero experience, you've never used blender in your life and we'll end up here and I'll teach you all the steps along the way, we'll slowly be progressing, finding new tools, methods, techniques, whatever you want to call it, it's all explained in here. This took a lot of time and planning and if you like this idea, drop a like, hit the bell, you know, all the YouTuber stuff, but we'll get to our merry way. The first part is dedicated towards learning Blender, the interface, what things do, how to move around and stuff. So if you're familiar with Blender, you can skip this episode or you can stick around and uh, find some nice tips. But for the rest of us, we'll just begin. This is what Blender looks like when you first open it up. You get this pop-up with the most uh, recent projects and some templates to start with. You can click away to enter the software. And your scene will start like this. You'll have a camera, a cube and a light. I don't because I switched up the settings, but we can get to that later. Anyway, welcome to Blender. Disclaimer, this next part of the course is just information dump, so I can prepare you for what we'll encounter in the future parts. It's a little overwhelming, but don't get scared, I'm just throwing everything at you at once, so you're prepared when we see it in the future. Don't think about it too much. Let's proceed. This big window right here, that's your 3D viewport, and this is where you'll spend most of your time. This is where you model and do all the fancy stuff. This up here is the outliner, and it shows you everything you have in the project, as well as collections, folders, and some extra settings. Down here, what is this called? This is the properties tab, and this is where you find settings for everything, like from the scene to the world, to the selected object. This is where you find settings about everything there is to see in the software. But we'll have plenty of time to visit these two later on, so let's focus on the viewport. First of all, how do you actually move around and do stuff? Well, to move around, you click the middle mouse button and drag. This is how you orbit around. Now, if you also hold down shift, you will pan around. So you can pan, orbit, you can also use your scroll mouse to scroll in and out. What if you don't have a three button mouse? What if you have a laptop mouse, you know, the mouse pad, what is it called? That is when you would go into edit, preferences, under input, you find emulate three button mouse. That will let you pretend like you have a three button mouse. Okay, if I click this, if you hold down alt and left click, then it will do the same as if the three button mouse. And if you also hold down shift, then you will pan. So instead of your middle mouse, you'll use, you're using alt and left click. But yeah, that's how you navigate. There's also one special trick if you want to enter fly mode. For that, let's go to edit preferences once again and click on key map and then up here bras for fly you'll find walk navigation, fly. If you click on this window, you can set a shortcut for this. I usually go with shift F because F stands for fly. Anyway, now we have this. Uh, if I press shift and F, I'm now in fly mode. I can use WASD keys to move around. If you want this to be faster, you can use your scroll mouse, scroll up and now it's faster and faster. Okay, you can move around. WASD, and you can press Q and E to go up and down. So you can position that way and click once you're done. That's all the navigation stuff. Now let's get to some of the tools. Let's select the cube. In this corner up here, you have different tools such as the move tool, rotate, scale, you know, and you can actually move these gizmos to affect what you're doing. Uh, I actually prefer shortcuts. This is the only tool that I always have on. You can press the T key to hide or bring back the toolbar. So instead of the move gizmos, like I've just shown you, I actually prefer to use shortcuts because they're faster and pretty intuitive. You can press G to grab and you can move around. So G to grab, R to rotate, and S to scale. What if you want more control? Okay, so when you press G, while the block is now in your mouse, you can press X, Y, or Z to lock it onto that axis individually. So I can move it on the X axis. I can then move it only on the Y axis. And in the move tool, you've also noticed we have plain gizmo, so you can slide it on the floor on two axes at once. Is there a shortcut for that? Well, of course it is. So when you press G, uh, let's say I want to move it on the X and the Y. So everything except Z. In that case, instead of pressing Z, I would press Shift and Z. So now Z is being excluded from the operation. Uh, let's say I want to move it on everything but the Y axis. So I can move it on these two, you know? Same goes for rotate and scale. So rotate on X, Y, Z, scale as well. So scale on X, scale on Y, scale on Z, or everything but the Z or everything but the X, you know, it's the same thing. If you did an operation that you don't wish to apply, instead of left clicking, which would apply it, you just right click to cancel that operation. And that works for anything else, like any other tool. If you don't want to apply something, you press right click to cancel and go back to where you began. Now, most windows also have the N sidebar panel. 
So there's T for the toolbar and there's N for the sidebar, I guess is what it's called. I'm gonna go up to item because this is this is my cube. If I move it around, you can see the location value is changing because this is the same value. You can preview all of the properties. You could be precise and just type in the number you want here and you know, it's gonna snap onto that number. You can also hold left click and you can drag it left and right and move it this way if that's what you want. Let's say I want to change all of these to five meters, for example. Click and drag down and then release my mouse press five or I can click and drag down and then once I have everything highlighted just move it left and right and it's gonna use all three you can also quickly reset all the values by just ju just hovering this area and pressing backspace like boom. it resets everything back to zero and we have our cube again blender is also great because you can customize it as much as you want like the interface it can be anything you want you might have noticed probably not though Every window has a curved edge here. So this one up here, you know, the outliner, little curved edges all around. Properties panel has curved edges. Uh, the viewport also has curved edges. And when you put your mouse in there, it changes into this cross. And what that essentially is, is you can, you can pull out new windows. This is the center between the windows. If you put your mouse on one side and then drag into that same side, you will open a new window. And you can change that window to be anything you want. I can have another outliner here because why not properties you know or another 3d viewport so you know if i want to hop in the camera mode and preview something in camera as i'm working on it you know if you want to close a window you would go onto one side of the center and then drag across that center which will collapse it back in if that's too confusing i think you can also right click and then join areas and then you get to pick which one it is yeah i'm putting this one on the right, so I'm collapsing that in. I just prefer this, right? Because you can quickly open your windows and collapse them without having to click anything. I hope that makes sense. You can see my mouse, what I'm doing. Hopefully it makes sense. While on this topic, let's open a new window. You can always press N to hide the sidebar if it's in the way. And let's change it into the UV editor. This is something we'll use a lot because it has to do with textures. And what I like about the interface altogether is that it has the same controls. Okay, we'll talk about this later. I just want to demonstrate. But if you want to move UV islands, you can press G to move. R to rotate, S to scale. If you want to pan around, you can just middle mouse. It's the same controls all over the software, any window, any workspace. It has a really forgiving learning curve. That's what I'll say. But you saw me do this. Well, what is this about? Well, you're familiar with 3D modeling. There's complex shapes and characters, and you can't really get from that by just using simple cubes. If you want to have a complex model, which isn't just a normal cube or a sphere or, an, or any object primitive, you have to mold it, shape it, and you know, this is the tool where we do that. If you press tab on your keyboard, with the object selected, of course, you'll jump into edit mode. Or you can just use the drop down up here to jump from object to edit mode. It's the same thing. Like, there's shortcuts and there's buttons for everything. Inside edit mode, you have three other modes, I guess. So this is the vertex select mode, edge select mode, and face select mode. So remember how we're, how we can scale, move, and rotate the cube? You can do that for individual parts of the model as well. So now I'm in vertex mode. You can also swap between these by pressing one, two, and three uh, keys on your keyboard. So I can jump between them very, very fast. Keep that in mind. Let's say with vertex mode, I can click on a vertex and I can move it around. I can't really scale it or rotate it because it's just a single point. It's impossible to do anything with that. But if you select multiple, you can scale those apart, you know? And you can change this cube into whatever you want. The world is your oyster, ha ha ha. Same with edge mode. You can, you know, move entire edges or rotate or scale them. Or you can also move faces. So if I grab this bottom face, I can move the entire face at once and all the others will be connected still. You can also rotate, scale, you know. I don't think I have to explain this, it makes sense. So vertices, ed edges, and faces connect together into what is called a mesh. Let me just scale this face on the z-axis to zero, so it's flat. A mesh is a whole shape made out of all these faces or polygons, as you would call them. But when you hop out of edit mode, this is now an object. So the cube is an object and this is a mesh. I'm in edit mode now, so if I were to duplicate this with Shift D is the shortcut, I'm still in edit mode, so when I press tab to go back into object mode, I still just have one object. This is still one object, the cube. But the cube object contains two different meshes. Make sense? Still with me? So a mesh is a connected shape, something like I have right here but an object is that one item that contains as many meshes as you want, really. So if I delete these faces by pressing X to delete, and then say delete all the selected faces, I have one object that contains one mesh. 
And then in object mode, if I press Shift D to duplicate, I now have two objects. Both of them contain a single mesh. Okay, but how can you customize your mesh as much as you want? Let's hop back into edit mode. And there's a few other operations you can perform on this. For example, a very popular one is pressing Control R to add a loop cut. You can select where the loop cut will be added by hovering different edges. Let's, let's place it here. And then I can slide it left and right, or I can just, you know, like, like I said before, press right click to center it back. So I have another edge on my shape now and I can move these. This just gave me more resolution to work with. You can also add multiple, so control R for a loop cut and then you can scroll your mouse wheel up and down. Let's say I want three, or you can type in the number. So let's type the number three, I want three edges. Then click and if you want to slide them or not, or you can just press right click to center them back. Now I have much more resolution to make something more complex than a single cube. There's also a very popular one. So let's hop into face mode, select the face. You can press E to extrude or I to inset. You can press E to extrude and move it inwards and you have a hole all of a sudden. You can select multiple faces at once to extrude. You can also extrude edges. So if I go to edge mode, select an edge, press extrude, and I've just dragged a new face out of this edge. You can also extrude single vertices. If I extrude that, now I have a floating edge without any geometry and I can extrude that. You can also select a lot of edges. And by the way, if you don't want to click to select all of them, you can hold down alt and click and it'll select the whole ring for you. You can select the edges and press Control B to bevel. This will bevel the edge. You can also, while the bevel is active, you can also scroll up and down to give it more subdivision so it's more smooth. We got this weird monstrosity from a single cube. Okay, let's delete this. I don't like this. Let's also delete everything in the scene. I like to start with a blank slate. If you want to add something that's uh, worth mentioning, you can drop down this add menu and search for whatever it is you want to add here. Or again, I'm a guy with shortcuts, so let's press Shift A like A for add, you know, the, the shortcuts make sense. It's the same letter. Let's go to mesh and let's add a UV sphere. Once you add it, before you click anything else, you have this little menu here. You can open it up and you can customize your cube. So how many segments does it have? Let's give it 16 segments, you know, so it's more low poly. Let's give it 60 rings. So now it's very dense. You can customize what it's gonna look like. And if you happen to click away that you lose this, you can press F9 to bring that menu back. As long as that's the last operation you did. Okay, let's hop into edit mode here because I wanna teach you some methods of selecting. If you wanna select a whole ring, you hold down Alt and click or click this one, you know, so you can select different bands. If you want to add to the selection, you can hold down Shift and click all the edges you want or vertices like or faces that works with anything really. If you want to select something from this point to this point really quick, you can hold down Control and it's gonna, you know, select to the shortest path. So click, click, this is the shortest path from one face to the other. This also works with edges, obviously. So these are smart tools to know. So if you want to select multiple bands, you hold down Alt and click. But if you want to add to selection, you hold down Shift. So if you hold Shift and then Alt click something else, you'll add a whole new loop to your selection, right? If you want to select parallel edges, you hold down Control and Alt. This will select parallel edges. And if you want to add those, you add Shift to the mix. So we add to your selection. I'm just info dumping on you because we'll be using a lot of this later. We only have seven parts, so the course is slightly faster paced. So the first episode is dedicated to information dump on you so you can learn as much as possible. Get familiar, learn the shortcuts, you know. I'm giving you homework at the end of every lecture, okay? Your homework is to learn the interface. That's why I'm dumping everything on you right now. Okay, so now that we know how to manipulate meshes, I can do whatever I want, you know, select, scale this out. You can add loop cuts and scale this in. You can scale this out and then bevel it so it's rounded. All basic operations slowly add together. You just have to know what you want to create. So now that we know this stuff, let's talk about orthographic mode. While you're orbiting around, when you get close to one of the sides, I guess, you can hold down Alt and it will snap you to orthographic mode. This is a view mode without any perspective whatsoever. You can continue orbiting and it's gonna snap you out of it normally. Let me just delete this with X and add a cube which I'm going to rotate slightly. So when I orbit, I hold down Alt as I get close to one of the sides and it snaps me in. You can keep going and it's gonna snap you out. So it only works when you're close to one of the edges and then you let go of the middle mouse. And it works for any side, like 
top, down, left, right. But you can also jump into orthographic by pressing the number five on your numpad. Now you're constantly in orthographic mode. This has no perspective. So it's like completely flat from one side and it helps you when you're modeling things from the side or when you want to see something completely flat, where is it going? We'll also be using that in the course. And if you want to hop out, you just press numpad five and that's it. The numpad is also useful for different views. If you press two, four, six, or eight, four and six are gonna snap you by 15 degrees left and right. Eight and two are gonna snap you by 15 degrees up and down. I think it's 50, yeah, it's 15. Uh, then five is orthographic, we've discussed before. And then if you press one, three, seven, or nine, so any of the corner ones, it'll snap you to different orthographic modes. So this is front, this is right, uh, this is top and this is bottom. So one, three, seven, nine. But then you can also just use your mouse to do the same thing. So while you're here, you just hold down Alt and snap directly into whatever you want. I prefer the mouse method, but I also want to explain how to use the shortcuts and other, other ways to do the same thing. One very useful tool I haven't yet talked about is the knife tool. So let's hop into edit mode, press K for the knife tool. You can click anywhere you want and you're gonna start cutting onto the model. And when you click enter in the end, you have added those edges onto your model. If you want to add multiple non-connecting ones, you can, you know, press K for the knife tool, and then you cut something. But then I want another cut here, but I don't want this to be connected. Just right click. You're still in the cut tool, but it's now disconnected. So now you start connecting other things like this, and then press enter in the end, and this is your cut. This is easy to add more topology or details that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise. You can also hold down shift to snap in the middle of any edge, so now you're sliding Placing it down directly on the middle, like that, you know, and then you can go to face mode and extrude that, you know, <laughs> useful. Okay, let's go back to object mode and press N for the sidebar. Okay, I'm gonna add a new cube just because. Let's say I've, I need a rectangle, I need a log rectangle. So I scale this on the Y axis, like so. This is a nice rectangle, I like this rectangle. But under object transformations, we now have a value on the scale, which is not uniform. So if I were to try to make textures for this or try to simulate the physics or try procedurally beveling this, I'm skipping ahead. You don't have to know about this yet, just pay attention. I added the bevel, now it's stretched on the sides because it's now scaled. The software thinks this is still a cube, it's just scaled on the sides. So any operation you add on top of that, such as, you know, UV unwrapping for the textures or phys physics simulations or, you know, beveling in this case, it's going to apply that operation first and then scale the cube apart so it's all gonna fall into the water, as you would say. So at the end of everything, always make sure that your scale is always applied, as you say. So it's always one, it doesn't have any excess scale. And the way you do this is by selecting the object and pressing Control A, which lets you apply all this stuff. So let's apply the scale. The scale has been set back to one, and the software now knows, oh, okay, so this is a rectangle, it's not scaled, it's just a normal rectangle and, you know, everything goes back to normal. Which is also why sometimes if you want to scale something, it's better to first go into edit mode, then you just select everything by pressing the letter A, A for all, and then scale it in edit mode and then come back to the object mode because that didn't mess with the actual scale. Again, useful tip, just keep the scale at one at all times. Having position and rotation is not that bad, but scale, Always one. Always. Let's say I want to rotate this cube, but it's going too fast. I want to be more precise. Let's go into top orthographic mode for this. And I want to really align this to the Y axis for some reason. If you want to be more precise, you can always hold down shift. And hold down shift, it's going to slow down. It also works with sliders. I want to move this on the X axis, but I want to go very slow. Hold down shift and it's going to move very slow. This is the same for any operation. You wanna scale, hold shift to slow down. You wanna move, hold shift to slow down. You wanna drag a slider, move shift to hold down. Always shift. Even in other parts like material sliders, hold shift to slow down. This will be a reoccurring theme. And also, like I've said before, all the keyframe shortcuts that I keep doing, so G, R, S, shift A, all of this can always be found in the menus up here. So add, uh, you have G, shift, R, just look around, click on these. Also, when I've applied the scale, so it's always one, object, apply, and it's all in here. So anything that you're not sure where to find, click around the drop downs, and you'll always find anything. So it's not a big deal if you forget the shortcut. If you if you know what you want to do, like if you want to apply something, you can, you can always just press F3, which is the search, apply, 
Huh, okay, so I can apply transformations, I can apply location, rotation, rotation scale. So these are the same options that I have in the menu, but also it tells you control A what the shortcut is. So if I click out, control A, you know, you can find whatever you're looking for. Don't, don't be too scared about having to memorize everything at once. One thing we'll also have to be careful about in the future of the course is good topology. Topology stands for the distribution and structure of vertices, edges and faces on a 3D model. In other words, how those edges are flowing. One sec, one sec. Okay, I've done something to mess this sphere up. So if I want to, if I want to add a loop cut here, it's gonna stop. Why? Well, because there's a triangle here and it doesn't know in which direction it has to go. So this kind of messed me up a little bit. Okay, if I add this and then add another loop cut, it's now going to redirect it down completely. Why? Well, because this triangle here is now made up of four vertices. So it thinks it's a square and the opposite of this is down. So when I add a loop cut, it's gonna go down and completely mess up my entire workflow. What if I wanna move this vertex? Oh, there, there's not enough geometry here. I wanted this part to stay up. So I had to add a knife cut just so I can move this out, which introduces even more problems. So topology and edge flow are important and I'll teach you how to avoid mistakes like this in the course as well. I made this example so you're familiar with the term topology so when I talk about topology you know what I mean. It's easier workflow, less issues, but also if I do something like uh, get rid of these edges, this face right here is currently made up of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different vertices. If I move one of them what exactly is happening with the shape? It's really uneven, and although it's being shaded like very smooth, it's jagged. It's going like from one direction to the other, completely deforming, you know? And when you hit that render button, that will probably look very ugly and glitchy in the end. So it's important to keep this cut. See what happens when I press enter. Boom, it's shaded differently because it realizes that it's off a different angle. That's like having a plane and then moving the ends up. The shape doesn't know what to do here. Where does it connect it, you know? That's why in weird places like this, you need an edge up here to divide it this way, or you need an edge here to divide it that way. Without an edge, this shape does not know what to do, does not know how to shade itself. So we'll also be careful at that when we work. If you have multiple objects and you're in edit mode, you won't be able to select anything else until you hop out of edit mode and then select the other object. Uh, if you select multiple objects and then hop into edit mode, you can edit multiple objects at once. That is possible. So we've been watching these gray blobs for a while. So how do you actually get textures? First of all, your object needs a material. So let's add a material. Let's give it some color, red for now. And we don't see it. Why is that? Textures are expensive to render, so your graphic card has to work to draw the textures every time you move around and stuff. So to prevent lag for a more smoother workflow, 3D softwares usually have a solid shading mode, which is what we have right now. This is all solid. If you want to see the textures, you have to hop into texture mode up here. These are the four icons, the four different rendering modes, or you can press Z to bring up the pie chart and you can select it here. It's faster, but it's the same thing. So let's go into material preview and now we can see the material. Let's give a different material to our sphere and give it green, right? In the future, instead of just picking colors and all the other properties like metal and stuff, instead of just picking the value, we're going to link a texture to that. So instead of just a single color, we're gonna have a texture. The other mode is wireframe, which is only going to render the wireframe mode of the object, so you can see the topology. And finally, rendering mode, which is what it will look like rendered. We don't see anything yet because there's no lights in the scene, so let's add a light very quickly. Bring it up. And with the light selected, down here we have this uh, light icon. This is so you can control the light. Let's bring up the power to something stronger and you can see what this will look like rendered. However, Blender has multiple render engines, so we're currently previewing it with Eevee, which is the quick, real-time, cheaty, not-so-good-looking version. But we can also switch this to Cycles, which is proper ray tracing. We'll talk more about this in the future. You don't have to know about that, it's fine. Let's hop back into solid mode. You've also probably noticed that when you select multiple things, one of them is highlighted with a brighter color. If we add more objects, we can tell only one of them is selected with a brighter color and the rest are darker. This is the active selection. 
There are certain operations that just require one, some form of active selection. Let's select all of them. And if I want to merge everything into a single object, shortcut is control J, J for join. If I select that, it's all going to merge under sphere because this was my selected object. Okay, let's undo this. Let's add two cubes and give one a bevel modifier. This is something we'll learn more about later. And let's give the other one a subdivision modifier. This is a procedural operation. So if I go into edit mode, my cube still exists. This is just like a modifier you add on top. It doesn't matter. We'll learn about this later. But let's say you want to merge these two items together. What happens to the modifiers? This is my active selection. So if I join it now, plop, it's going to copy its modifier. So this one had the bevel. So now they both have the bevel. The subdivision just gets forgotten about. And if I do the other thing, so this is my active selection now. So if I join these, they're both going to apply the other modifier because they're now part of a same object with the same object data. Just so you know what the active selection is and how it works. Trust me, much more of this will make sense in the future. But I want to explain it now so you're aware of it and you're prepared for when we actually face that. And one more important thing that I really need to talk about is normals. What are normals? I'm going to add a plane up into edit mode and extrude this edge up on the Z axis. So every polygon, every face has a direction where it's pointing out. So what's outside and what's inside the shape. We can actually see that and I'll show you more about that later. So these blue lines are all pointing out from the shape. Each face has a normal where it's pointed. So if I rotate the face, the normals are going to rotate with it. And that's the direction where the face is pointing. And the normals have everything to do with shading, how this thing is going to get shaded. If I right click this and set the shade to smooth, it feels much more of a higher quality and smoother and stuff but it's actually the same shape with the same normals. And that's the difference between split normals and average normals. Imagine it like this. These two faces are pointing out. This is what it looks like when normals are averaged. We know there's an edge here. We know there's only two faces. This guy is pointing up. This guy is pointing up. But the middle here is just average. It's like a grayscale. So it's like it's pointing in all of these directions slowly. So it transitions from one to the other to make it look like it's smooth. And then when you shade flat, which is what our UV sphere is doing right now, instead of this, we are actually getting this. Seems confusing. All the corners are pointing in the direction of the face. These are all pointing up. These are all pointing on the sides. And even if you want to average this little thing in the middle here, if you want to average this, they're so close together, you just get a hard edge. So what happens is you get this line. So when you shade smooth, you are doing this. And when you shade flat, you are doing this. What's also important is the direction. So sometimes your faces might get flipped backwards. So they're pointing inside the object. Let me do that on purpose right now. And it looks pretty normal here. But if you take a look at the face orientation, these faces here are flipped. They're pointing inside. So if I want to average them, you know, shade smooth, uh, something like this would happen because they're trying to blend from faces that are pointing into opposite directions. So in the middle of this transition, the faces are pointing inside itself and it's just awful. But there's also another issue. We're going to add modifiers to our object. So an operation on top of everything to make it look better. So this is a displacement modifier on a normal plane with a lot of uh, polygons. When I apply a displacement modifier, it's going to move it up or down because that's that's where all the normals are pointing, right? But here, some of the normals are pointing inside the object. These are pointing in. So what happens when I try to give the same modifier to the sphere, it's going to ruin it because on the inside, it's going to be pushing inwards instead of outwards. And it's a really simple fix. You turn on the face orientation. You either select all the faces and then press Alt N and flip them again. So they're flipped or you select everything, Alt N, recalculate outside and it's automatically going to going to detect what is outside, what is inside. None of this matter too much yet. I just want to inform you about its existence. So you have an understanding about what it is when we face it during the next part of this course. I know it's messy. I know it's probably confusing, but we have gone through most of the things that we'll encounter in this entire course. So when we encounter that, I'm going to be like, hey, remember that thing I talked about? Yeah, this is it. Let's solve it, right? And this is pretty much the conclusion of part one. We've learned a lot of things. You now know how to add things, move them, manipulate them, model them, you know. You know what to watch out for. You know where to find all the settings. At this point, you know Blender to a small extent. And like I've said in the beginning, I have homework for you. I'm going to post a part of this course every three days until it's done. 
So your homework until the next part comes out, you have three days, is to get familiar with the interface. This has to be your second nature. A project like this is not a small task. We have a lot of work to do, so the course is going to be slightly faster paced. Rewatch this video if you must, click things, try things out, break things, ask questions. Your job is to get familiar with this as much as possible, so by the time the next part comes out, it's natural. I'm still gonna go slow, I'm still gonna explain what's the shortcut, what to click, I'm not gonna breeze through it, but the longer this course is, the more I'm going to breeze through it and just explain what to do, because you should be able to do it by then. You have three days, I'll be grading you. Nah, I won't, I'm kidding. Thank you for watching part one. This was an introduction, as well as a preparation for what we'll be facing in the future. Next part is where it begins, for real. We will make this entire house in the next part. We'll use all the knowledge we learned today, as well as upgrade it with a bunch of new tools and features that I haven't explained today. Buckle up, I'm excited, and I'll see you then. Stay sharp.